Hello grade 11s and welcome back to this topic on quantitative aspects of chemical change. In today's lesson, we will investigate the application of more relationships. Let us join Keke as she works through this lesson. I'm on my way to errands. I thought we should spend some time in the lab and find out how the chemical calculations we've done so far can actually help us identify the products formed in a chemical reaction. We'll also do calculations to find out how chemists work out the ideal recipes so that waste is reduced in laboratories. Have a look at what we want to achieve in this lesson. By the end of today's lesson, you should be able to apply the relationship between moles and mass in order to solve typical chemical calculations. Hey, Aaron, what's cooking? Hey, KK. Okay, okay. You know, I thought you could kick off with um, a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to tell me, what do you think the products will be if you react calcium with water? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. Calcium could combine with the hydrogen in the water and release oxygen. Or calcium could combine with the oxygen in the water and release hydrogen. Calcium could also combine with oxygen and hydrogen to form calcium hydroxide. Of course, a gas might still be given off in this case too. Well, why don't we set up a qualitative investigation to start off with? Sounds like a plan. Now guys, when Keka says qualitative investigation, what she really means is that we're just going to throw some calcium into a test tube and see what happens. During a qualitative investigation, careful observations are made of the results of an experiment, but no calculations or measurements are done. Right. I've added a few granules of fresh calcium to this test tube. Look, bubbles of gas are forming. I'm going to collect the gas and test it. Because we're using water in this experiment, this could be hydrogen or oxygen gas. Can you remember how to test for these gases? Remember, a glowing splint will reignite in the presence of oxygen and a popping sound will be heard when a burning splint is plunged into hydrogen. This gas makes a popping sound when a burning splint is plunged into it. So the gas released must be hydrogen. That creates a bit of a problem, doesn't it? Absolutely. What we know from our qualitative investigation is that hydrogen and not oxygen is released as a gas. So the oxygen must be reacting with the calcium to form the second product. What we don't know is whether all the hydrogen was released or if some of it is reacting with the calcium and oxygen to form a hydroxide. The problem is that both calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide are white solids. There is no way we can tell for sure what the second product is from just our observations. Mm. Well, guys, this is where all that practicing of chemical calculations is going to start paying off. That's right. You know what, if we write the two theoretical equations of our two possible products, we would get, for me, for the reaction of calcium and water to form calcium oxide and hydrogen gas, Ca plus H2O react to form CaO plus H2. And for the reaction of calcium and water to form calcium hydroxide and hydrogen gas, Ca plus 2H2O react to form Ca plus 2OH plus H2. We can use these equations plus a known mass of calcium as a reactant to predict what the mass of the two products would be. Then all we have to do is redo the experiment using the same mass of calcium that we used in our calculations, compare the mass of the actual product formed to our predictions and see which product it is. When we do an experiment using specific measured out quantities of reactants, and our purpose is to measure the quantities of the product formed, we call this experiment quantitative investigation. So, let's do this quantitative investigation by measuring out an exact mass of calcium on the chemical balance. First, I find the mass of the beaker and record it. Next, I add a sample of calcium into the beaker and record this reading too. Can you see how to find the mass of the calcium? We subtract the mass of the beaker from the mass of the beaker and the calcium. So the mass of the calcium is 4,0 grams? Yes. But in our experiment, we also have to make sure we put enough water for the calcium to react completely. 
So let's look at our equations again, see if they can give us an idea of how much water we'll need. Okay. Remember, the reason we write down and use the equations in our calculations is because the balanced equations show us the ratio of the number of moles reacting. So before we can find out how much water we'll need, we first need to calculate the number of moles in our measured out calcium sample. Let's go through this calculation together. The relative atomic mass of calcium is 40. The mass of the sample is 4 grams. To find the number of moles we use in the equation, N equals M divided by capital M, substituting in the values, we find that we have 0, 0,1 moles of calcium in the sample. Right. Now look at the equations again. Do you see that in the calcium oxide equation, one mole of calcium reacts with one mole of water to form one mole of calcium oxide and one mole of hydrogen. But in the calcium hydroxide equation, we have one mole of calcium reacting with two moles of water to form one mole of each of the products. So, to make sure that we have enough water for both possible reactions, we need to have twice as many moles of water as moles of calcium. We calculated that we have 0, 0,1 moles of calcium, so we need at least 0, 0,2 moles of water. But how much actual water is that? Well, we can calculate the mass of water by using the equation M equals N, the number of moles, times the molar mass. You should know that grams is not a unit of volume, so we need to convert our answer. But because we're working with water, there's a very useful relationship that we can use to make this conversion quickly. Water has a density of exactly one gram per centimeter cubed. This means one gram of water has a volume of one centimeter cubed. So 3,6 grams of water will have a volume of 3,6 centimeters cubed. You know, Keke, when I did this reaction first time, I noticed that heat was released. In fact, the test tube got so hot that some of the water evaporated. So I think that to make sure that all the calcium reacts, we need to add a little more water to the calcium. Okay. I will add five centimeters cubed. We say that the water is in excess in this reaction. This excess water will not change the amount of product formed, but will remain unreacted in the beaker. So, Aaron, what's next? I think we should calculate the theoretical values of the products that would form by using chemical equations and the relationships you've established during the series between moles and mass. Why don't you take the equation if the product is calcium oxide? And you calculate the mass if the product is calcium hydroxide. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Done. Done. Now let's check our answers. Let's first look at the calculation if the product is calcium oxide first. We started the reaction with 0, 0,1 moles of calcium, as we know from our earlier calculations. From the balanced chemical equation, we can predict that 0, 0,1 moles of calcium oxide would form. So now we need to find the mass of this product using the relationship between number of moles and mass. First, I found that the molar mass of calcium oxide is 56 grams per mole. Next, I can find the theoretical mass using the equation M equals N times capital M. Substituting in the values, I found that the theoretical mass is 5,6 grams. Well, what about the other possibility? What if the product is calcium hydroxide? Well, I follow the same steps. First, I calculated that the molar mass of calcium hydroxide is 74 grams per mole. Next, I found the theoretical mass using the equation M equals N times capital M. Substituting in the values, the calculation gives us a theoretical mass of 7,4 grams. Now we've come to the final steps of this investigation. We redo the experiment. That's right. <laughs> Watch what happens as I carefully add five centimeters cubed of water to the beaker that contains exactly four grams of calcium. The calcium reacts with the water and releases hydrogen gas. The white product starts to foam in the beaker. I'll seal the beaker to make sure no calcium remains unreacted. In this beaker, you should see that some white particles formed, but there is excess water too. To get rid of all the water, I will hit the beaker on the spirit banner. 
If any of the white product has dissolved in the water, it will be left behind after all the water has evaporated. It looks like I've gotten rid of most of the water and now I'm left with a white solid in the beaker. There may be a small amount of water trapped in the solid, so I'll need to dry it thoroughly. We do this by adding a few drops of acetone and then lighting this flammable liquid. The heat generated will dry the white product completely. Finally, we simply need to find the mass of our product. Remember, if the mass is 5,6 grams, then the product must be calcium oxide. But if the mass is close to 7,4 grams, then the product formed must be calcium hydroxide. The mass of the beaker and product is 62,26 grams. The mass of the beaker at the start of the investigation was 55,08 grams. So the mass of the product is 7,18 grams. This value is very close to the theoretical value for calcium hydroxide. So the powder must be calcium hydroxide. Exactly. Thank you for that, KK. It explained a lot. Well, that's all for today, Grade 11s. Make sure to attempt the task video at the end of this series. You can also find out more information on this topic at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Join me in the next lesson when we investigate titrations. Until then, goodbye.